It's still strange how a story like Stephen King's It became such a big deal, but just because something is popular doesn't mean it's good, much less perfect. Here's our list of the highlights and lowlights, and yes, the deadlights, of It, Chapter 2. Oklahoma's favorite son, Bill Hader, has really been showing off his dramatic chops in recent years. From his critically adored turn in HBO's Complex Barry, to his work in It Chapter 2 as the grown-up Richie Tozier. In the sequel, the trash mouth has grown from a neighborhood nuisance to a national sensation, or at least something like that, as an apparently well-known stand-up comic. In his role as the older Richie, Hader builds on everything that Stranger Things' Finn Wolfhard laid down for the character in Chapter 1, so much so that it takes no effort to believe that he's that kid, just 27 years older. The movie suggests that despite any appearance of material success, he's not living up to his full potential, an intriguing step up from the radio DJ role he played in King's book, with the writing for the character also being a notable step up from the limp, improvised jokes Harry Anderson strung together for the 1990 miniseries. I'll see my fortune now. You're gonna be eaten by a big greasy monster. Have a nice day. Despite what successes IT Chapter 2 may have in improving on the old miniseries, reviews have had one pretty consistent complaint. The grown-up members of the Losers Club don't really feel like old friends. They all feel more like they're meeting each other for the first time, and it's an impression that never really goes away. And before you go pointing out that the group members being distant towards each other was the whole point of the movie, with it all culminating in the characters reconnecting and learning to love one another again, we would like to counter by saying that at no point in this movie does it actually feel like these people are really connecting with each other. Everyone is frigid and chilly towards each other up until the point that they have to wrench the heart out of an ancient cosmic horror, when they all fight on the same side because, well, that's what you're supposed to do. One of the biggest strengths of the first It is the palpable sense of camaraderie that can be felt when the young cast is all interacting. Sparks are flying in these scenes, as are so, so many F-bombs. The kid scenes in the sequel still crackle with nostalgic energy, while the grown-up sequences all proceed as though their dialogues among strangers killing time at the DMV. Despite those complaints, don't get us wrong, IT Chapter 2 has assembled a fantastic cast. Seemingly willed into existence by Twitter posts and fan casting, the sequel triumphantly nails a difficult task while making it look pretty easy. Casting the same part across generations is one of those things that you don't really notice unless it's done in a way that doesn't really work that well, and the IT sequel does it so seamlessly that it even stops to flex about it. Emphasizing the similarities between James Ransom and Jack Dylan Grazer as Eddie Kasprak in a show off you transition shot. The new cast appeal isn't all about physical resemblance. James McAvoy deploys an American accent so convincing that you never question his character's main upbringing, and he also conveys the perfect level of frustration with his returning vocal stutter. J. Ryan somehow manages to come off as an adult Ben Hanscom, one who seems to be aware of how hot he's become in adulthood, but knows he's supposed to be cool about it. Even Andy Bean, in his brief turn as the adult Stan Uris, manages to make his few scenes resonate by finding the right way to express existential terror without coming across as too melodramatic. So even though the cast members rarely seem like real childhood friends, they do all come off as real people in their roles. Perhaps one reason why the cast has no chemistry is the fact the movie explicitly demands they stop spending time together at a critical point during their reunion. After returning to Derry, the group is told by Mike to split up to recover relics from their childhood by themselves. The middle of the movie follows them all as they go off on their own specific side missions, like it's the end of a video game and we need one last fetch quest before taking on the final boss. This plotline of needing to gather relics for the ritual of Chud is mostly an invention of the movies, which stretches to come up with a a good reason for the characters to spend time apart. As a result, we end up spending way too much of the movie watching the characters be isolated, facing their fears in an assembly line fashion that gets dull fast. Logically, the characters would probably want to stick together after realizing what Mike's told them is all real, and they're fighting a vengeful demon whom they only beat the first time by sticking together. Instead, the movie invents a reason for them to arbitrarily split up, not really because the story demands it, but more because the screenplay structure does. One of the reasons why the cast's lack of chemistry is so frustrating has to do with the one scene with them all together that the movie 100% nails. The initial reunion sequence at the Jade of the Orient Chinese restaurant. In King's book, this scene is less of a fun hangout sequence and more of an exposition engine, laying track for the plot to come, and the 1990 miniseries version of the scene is just weird, feeling very awkward and made for TV. But IT Chapter 2 brings the scene to life with an electric energy, with the memories of the Losers Club seem 
seeming to come back in real time as the protagonists loosen up, both through their renewed proximity to each other and the curative powers of alcohol. The only place where this scene doesn't improve on the old miniseries or the book is the climactic invasion of it as a bowl of demented fortune cookies, which jump up off the table and turn into CGI monstrosities that kind of all look like the horror movie equivalent of the Sonic trailer. Uh, meow? One of the most consistent sins of IT Chapter 2, aside from its over-reliance on jump scares and loud noises, is the overuse of way too much not-quite-there CGI during the movie's horror sequences. It almost feels like the movie overloads on creepy music and startling monster leaps-at-the-screen moments to make up for the fact that, on its own, a lot of the CGI stuff just isn't scary. CGI creature effects work best in something like a light-hearted Avenger-style movie, when you want to buy into the comic book fiction of it all and let the movie get away with things that look less than realistic. But that's generally not how things work with horror, which gets its most effective scares out of keeping the viewer engaged and drawing them into a nightmarish moment, making them believe, if even for just a second, that everything they're seeing is real. When a supposedly horrific sight makes you think more about what's new on Xbox than the fact that you're gonna die one day, it makes the scares much less effective and the movie they're in less capable of standing the test of time. That said, don't get us wrong, there are parts of IT Chapter 2 in which the horror all really works. Critics have said that Chapter 2 is less scary than its 2017 predecessor, and while this may be true by the time the Losers Club is fighting Pennywise as a giant spider and defeating it by screaming the F-word, it's not really true for the entire movie. Indeed, some sequences in the sequel shiver with such horror that they trounce anything the first movie put forward as a scare. Despite all the child slayings, the first IT movie had a tendency to feel more like a thrill ride than anything close to being psychologically affecting. That's not the case for some of IT Chapter 2's most genuinely disturbing scenes, which include the vicious assault and killing of a young gay man at the beginning of the movie, to Pennywise sickly manipulating and devouring a little girl underneath some dairy bleachers. Real horror should do more than just startle you. It should make you feel nasty and stick to you like a greasy slime. Pennywise leaping out of the dark with his claws out might make you jump while you're watching the movie, but these are the sequences that stick with you in the nights that follow. Of course, there's a lot to remember about IT Chapter 2 once you're done watching it, mostly because this sequel is a lot of movie. Like, too much movie. At 165 minutes, the sequel's runtime edges up toward Avengers Endgame levels, but that movie was MCU Chapter 22, not O2. It's a long story. While the movie doesn't feel truly punishing in its length on a first watch, it does feel every minute of its long length, and it doesn't really feel like an experience that digs deep enough into its themes or characters to really warrant that massive runtime. So much of the movie is given over to catching the audience up on where the characters are at in their lives, and then giving them each a protracted solo scare sequence, a structure that gets repetitive and tiresome well before the final battle comes around. You can say a lot of things about Stephen King, but one thing you can't deny is that the dude has a big imagination. Potent, eerie, too hot for TV imagination, to the tune of 1,138 pages of often insane storytelling. As a book, it is full of rich details and left turn sequences that seem inspired, at least in part, by a lenient editor and a lot of cocaine. For me, the fun of writing novels isn't in the finished product which I don't care about that much. It's to the credit of IT Chapter 2 that the sequel incorporates so many of the novel's weirdest elements, making the already strange story of a shape-shifting killer clown even weirder this time around. Though the two IT movies leave plenty of the more bizarre elements of King's story out of the adaptation, it's admirable just how much corning crap the movie commits to getting into, especially when it doesn't really need to explain too much about what's going on in Derry at all. Once the movie starts running through weird things like the ritual of Chud and its true form as the cosmic deadlights, you know you're watching a movie with some goofball genre swagger. This is a story that trusts you to stay with it through every weird turn, up to and including the part where the losers kill Pennywise by basically just hurting its feelings. Though IT Chapter 2 is willing to go to some strange places when it comes to its ancient cosmic origins, the movie doesn't exactly go whole hog with everything the book has to offer. And we're not just talking about the novel's Space Turtle. No, there are plenty of other story aspects from King's thick novel that just don't get a lot of play here. From the way the mere presence of IT is implied to bring out the evil in Derry's residence, to the wider lives of the grown-up losers, whose loved ones play more into the resolution of the story in the book than the movie wants to get into. One other notable loss 
is the instantly abandoned storyline of the grown-up Bev's abusive husband, who was given one scene to be a bad guy before Bev flees. This entire aspect of her life and character remains totally unresolved, and it speaks to a general lack of thematic storytelling in its second installment. If the first movie was about childhood and loss of innocence, the second movie is about… what exactly? For all its length and bluster, IT Chapter 2 isn't really about anything other than killing that clown. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.